come and be a part of this. Beginning at what time? 6.30. 630. Okay. Um, it'll be about an hour. There's going to be a short video segment taught by the author. Uh, there'll be questions and answers. Uh, we'll be reading the scripture and we'll be uh, just sharing together about having a new beginning in our lives and also in our, in our whole church. It's never too late for a new beginning and I'm glad to know that. Open your Bibles please to Acts chapter 8. We have witnessed a wonderful thing this morning as a husband and wife, uh, the Dumarises, did I come even close to say that? Uh, close, okay. Uh, Gessley and Gertie, I, I have asked them repeatedly, how do you say their name? I ask uh, in Sunday school, uh, Wilfred, tell me how to pronounce this, and it just, French escapes me, I apologize. But uh, du Marseille, okay. Uh, I, but we have heard, witnessed their baptism this morning, and that is exciting. Uh, almost all Baptist pastors have a, a few, after you've been a pastor for several years, you have a few things that happen at baptisms that are um, a little bit memorable or embarrassing. My very first one, uh, I was pastor of the Greater Metropolitan uh, Church in Hatchie, Tennessee. Some of you have probably been there on your vacation. Uh, no, actually, if you had been there, you would probably not know you had been when you drove through. There's just nothing there uh, except a little church building up on a hill. But we had uh, a small little frame, a little brick building. Uh, we had electricity, but we had no running water. So there was, uh, uh, they had two very loud air conditioning units in the windows that we used uh, a lot of the year. And uh, we had two outhouses because there was no running water. And of course, we didn't have a baptistry. And so uh, we went to the town about three miles away of Hornsby and baptized there, and so one Sunday evening, following uh, a special evangelistic event, I had seven people who were going to be baptized, and I was excited. This was my first church. I'd only been there a short time, and God had done something special, and I was just a kid. I was 22 years old, had just turned 22, and uh, Judy and I were newlyweds, and I was in my in seminary, and I was in my first pastorate, and the first lady who was going to be baptized, I had told her, explained how what, what we were going to do as best I could. I think she sensed that this was all new to me, and I was a little bit nervous, and she was a larger lady, and she sized me up, and I could see in her eye she was thinking, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's going to drown me. And uh, so I was wondering about that myself. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the baptistry was in the middle, like where the screen is up there, rather than over on the side like this one is. And uh, it was wide enough so that there was a curtain, but people could stand on the steps while others were in the water being baptized. And so there was... Lots of water over there on the steps. So she came in, and I said what I was going to say, and I proceeded to baptize her. But to my great surprise, when I laid her back into the water, she was positively buoyant. That is, she floated. And uh, the first thing that happened when she felt the water on her back was, she proceeded to get up, so this, this I, I was skinny then. Uh, this was before I gained all this weight. And uh, she was thought, well, I'm not going to let this boy drown me. And so she started trying to get up, but I was determined to push her under. 
And so as we floated out of sight behind the curtain, I was wrestling her under, and she was trying to get up. She won, by the way. I never did get her all the way under, but I, God bless her. Uh, that was a memorable experience. That was about 42 years ago. Uh, another time, uh, I was baptizing a large gentleman. I'd had 20 years of experience at that time. And when I say large, I mean he was three times my size. This was a New Hampshire uh, mountain man. And uh, I, I said to him, now you think that I can't get you up, but don't worry about it because you're going to float. So just let yourself go under. And the choir was up there, like 20, 30, 25, 35 people up in the choir. The, we were just behind the choir. And I said, just lay back into the water, and when you go all the way under, stand up. It'll be fine. I'm not going to drop you. It'll be okay. He trusted me. But it turned out he was solid. And when he went under, he went straight to the bottom, and I couldn't move him. <laughs> he weighed about, uh, well, he, he weighed three times what I weighed. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, but as he went back, he just went stiff like a board, and he fell back, and it was like a tree falling in the water. And the water went whoosh up the wall and back down and then a wave came over onto the backs of the choir. <laughs> and uh, then suddenly there was this big hand came up and back grabbed the, the, the side and he pulled himself up. And as, I, as he walked up, I said, we, we are raised and walk in obedience to Christ. And away he went. Uh, but he has trusted me since and he's still my friend. And the last time we were in New Hampshire, he took us out to dinner. Uh, but you might say, I've heard of baptisms. I've seen christenings. What you did this morning was really strange. Why did you go all the way under? What you didn't know was the heater didn't work. And the water was pretty chilly this morning on those folks. And I appreciate them being courageous. But you know here in Connecticut, they used to go down and chop the ice off the river and baptize people. So we didn't at least do that today. Uh, but you may have seen a sprinkling. You may have seen pouring. And you might be wondering, why did you do this where you dunked them all the way under? And you've told us a couple of stories. Those were kind of embarrassing. Uh, baptism. Why bother with that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Why do we have baptisms? Look in Acts chapter 8. We have just read it together. And uh, I want to to talk to you about this experience that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch had as the eunuch trusted Christ and was baptized just like these people, uh, Gertie and Gesley, baptized this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, please speak to our hearts through the word. And make your word applicable. If we've already been baptized, we may be saying, well, this has nothing to do with me. Hurry and get this over with. Uh, but Lord, please make this personal and applicable to each of us. And I pray there'll be something in this message that you'll remind us of from the word that will stir our hearts and we'll go away more excited about you and someone who has never trusted you will understand what it means to trust you today. And someone who hasn't yet been baptized and has been thinking about it 
we'll make that final decision to obey you today. And we pray, thank you for these, this family, this couple, baptized and giving their testimonies this morning. And Lord, we give you praise. Speak to us now through the word. And I know the enemy would want to distract us. So, Lord, today I want to ask you to put the whole armor of God upon us. We take it on by faith. I put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. We put on the shoes of the gospel of peace and we take in our hands our Bibles, the sword of the Spirit. And above all, Lord, we take the shield of faith to snuff out the fiery darts of the wicked ones. So, Lord, would you speak to us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a couple of points that I want to make from this passage. And the first is, here I see the principle that you must be baptized, uh, must be saved before you are baptized. Now, I want you to notice the story as it unfolds. Beginning in verse number 26, you see that an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. Philip was one of the first six deacons chosen by the church. Philip was in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. But then he was called to be an evangelist. And persecution had broken out in Jerusalem. And the persecution that caused Stephen to be stoned sent Philip to Samaria. Now notice down in verse number 4 that Philip went down to Samaria. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 4. Now those who were scattered, that is because of the persecution, went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord, paid attention to what uh, was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. And verse 8 says, as a result of their believing, there was much joy or there was great joy in that city. And look at verse 12. And when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Now you get the picture. There was a great and exciting spiritual awakening going on. People were being saved by the dozens and dozens. Philip helped them organize a church. And they were be, people were being baptized and becoming members of that church. And they were beginning to be discipled. And people were coming down from Jerusalem to help him, them with the ministry. And verse 26 says that in the middle of that great awakening where Philip was the center of it all and the preacher of the gospel, and many people were responding, suddenly an angel speaks to him and says, leave there and go down to Gaza. It's a desert place. Now why in the world would God direct him to leave the crowds and go down to a desert? He may have wondered, but verse 27 says, and he arose and he went. Even if he questioned why, he still obeyed. And that's good. But it wasn't long until he got the answer if he was asking the question because there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. Here was the secretary of the treasury of the nation of Ethiopia. And he had been up to Jerusalem to worship God. He was a man who had a heart hungry to know God. And he had taken it very seriously. He had traveled 200 miles one way in a wagon over Hot, dusty, sandy roads. 
And while he was in Jerusalem, he had bought a copy of the book of Isaiah. Buying a scroll was no small thing. It was an expensive thing. He was a serious seeker after God. And as he's riding back home in his uh, wagon, in his chariot, in his carriage, he's reading this scroll of Isaiah. And the Spirit spoke to Philip, verse 29, and said, go over and join the chariot. And so Philip jogged over beside the chariot. He ran over there. And he heard him reading from Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? Now, a couple of principles that I see here. One is the great reminder that God is concerned about individuals. Aren't you glad of that? God is concerned about individuals as well as crowds. Second thing, no God-given assignment is insignificant. Maybe I can state that positively rather than negatively. Every God-given assignment is significant. If your assignment from the Lord is to take care of your child. And you're doing that faithfully in your home. You're caring, you're feeding, you're changing diapers, you're cleaning, you're doing all the stuff of being a mom, but God has given you that job. Do it with joy. It is significant. It is important. The point I'm trying to make is, we are often ready to step forward and do the things that get noticed, the things that are up front. But some are not so ready to do the behind-the-scenes stuff. But I want you to know that, that every assignment from the Lord is significant. So, here's the question. When was Philip most effectively doing the will of God? When he was preaching to the crowds in Samaria? Or when he was riding in a wagon explaining Isaiah to one guy? It's a trick question. <laughs> it's not either or. The answer is both times. Uh, when God said go down to the desert and talk to one guy, that was obeying God and that pleased the Father. When he said go to Samaria, and preached to the crowds, and he did that, that was obeying God. Whatever your assignment from the Lord is, be faithful in it. That is pleasing to the Lord. There, every assignment from every God-given assignment is significant. God cares about individuals, but there's one other thing. God is constantly working around us to connect witnesses with needy hearts. To connect witnesses with needy hearts. Every morning, you can pray, Lord, I want to be available to you today. Lead me to someone that I need to talk to. And when you lead me to them, help me to recognize it, not overlook it. You with me? To not overlook it, to, to recognize it. And give me the wisdom to know what to say, and then the courage to open my mouth and say it. Sometimes I know what to say, but I just don't have the courage to open my mouth to say it. Have you ever been in that situation? You know you ought to share with someone. And you, afterwards, you don't. And you regret it. I can think back on a couple of occasions that still sort of haunt me. Uh, so, but God can use 
us and he is working around us to connect the witnesses with the needy hearts. And here Philip goes over and he says to him in verse number 30, as he's running along beside his chariot, he asks him a really important question. Do you understand what you're reading? Now let me just say, the Bible was written to be understood. Did you know that? It is not written in holy gobbledygook. A lot of people think that. In fact, I, uh, several years ago, a man asked me, what kind of Bible do you read? Because I understand it when you read it. I didn't know you could understand the Bible. He truly thought it was just holy gobbledygook and nobody was supposed to understand it except a religiously trained people, a person, a priest or a preacher. And he was amazed that when the Bible was read in public, he actually understood what it meant. That's God's plan. It's written in the common language of people. Did you know that the Greek, uh, the New Testament, was originally written in a language called Koine Greek, which just means common Greek. And for a long time, they didn't know about that. They knew it was different from classical Greek, and they didn't know what kind of Greek it was. They could read it and understand it, but it was different. It was simple. And they thought it was a holy language, a holy form of Greek that God had inspired and made just for the Bible. Until a group of archaeologists digging in a pyramid down in Egypt opened up a mummified crocodile. And that thing was stuffed full of papers written in Greek. And it was receipts, and it was business transaction, and it was just common, everyday stuff. And they discovered it was the same Greek that the Bible was written in. This is written in good news for modern man, common, everyday, marketplace language. You know why? Because God wants you to understand it. God wants you to understand what it, what it says. The Bible is written to be understood. But this man was reading, and he understood the words, but it wasn't getting through. He wasn't quite figuring it out. Verse 31, he said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in, in the chariot, in the wagon. Now, as they, the passage that he was reading was Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. What a, what a divine appointment passage that was. Because that is a passage that tells about the death, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. And he said, who's he talking about? Himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, Isaiah 53, he told him the good news about Jesus. You see, this passage says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's kind of like, suppose this Bible was the record of your life. In the front is your birth certificate. In the back is your death certificate. And in between, in very, very fine print, is all of your actions attitudes, sins, and successes throughout your life. The record of your life. Here's the reality. We're all like sheep. We tend to wander. 
we tend to go off the path. We tend to stray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. We've gone our own way. We've done our own thing. Isn't that right? But here's the great news. The Lord has laid on Him, on Jesus, the guilt of us all. You see, the record of my life is on me. And my sin is separating me from God. But the Father on the cross took my sin and laid it on Jesus. And what does that do for me? That makes me free. That makes me clean. Well, that's what Philip began to explain to the Ethiopian. He's, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ. You heard about Him when you were up in Jerusalem, didn't you? A lot, there's a lot of controversy over, over Him, but I want you to know He is the Messiah. He's the promised Savior. And though you have sinned, God will forgive your sin and He'll cleanse your sin if you'll trust Him. And so the eunuch believed. He received Jesus and as they went along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now that was an important question. You see, this eunuch had gone up to Jerusalem to worship. But instead of finding a welcome to the family of God, everywhere he turned, he found a barrier that said, stay out. Over in the temple, there were different sections. There was an inner court that was called the Holy of Holies. And there was a big uh, curtain in front of that. And no one was allowed to go behind the curtain. That's the thing that was ripped from top to bottom when Jesus uh, died on the cross. But you know what they did? Sewed that thing up and just kept going on like usual. Carrying on business as usual. And so there was that barrier that said, only the high priest can go into this area once a year. Outside of that was the court of the priest. Only Levitical priests could go in there. They were from one tribe, the tribe of Levi. None of the men from the other 11 tribes of Israel could go in. Just those. Outside of that was the court of the men. Only Jewish men could go in there. Outside of that was the court of the women. Only Jewish women went in there. And around that was what was called a sacred enclosure, and there was a doorway and a sign on the door that archaeologists have discovered that read, any Gentile going beyond this point will be personally responsible for his death. We're going to execute you if you go through here. Talk about a welcome. Outside of that was the court of the nations or the court of the Gentiles. And, only, and the Gentiles could go and they could kneel and they could worship there. But they couldn't go into one of these other places. But you know what? Not only were there religious and racial barriers, this was a Gentile from North Africa. Uh, not only were there racial barriers and religious barriers, there was another barrier. There was a physical barrier. You see, this man was a eunuch. He had been emasculated by his master. And Deuteronomy 23.1 says, No one who has been emasculated, you can read it, it's a little more vivid in the text, who has been emasculated by his master is allowed into the sanctuary. So this man with a hungry heart who had traveled 200 miles to get close to God and to meet God. Everywhere he went, there was a barrier and probably he wasn't even allowed to go into the court of Gentiles. If he worshipped God at the temple, he did it outside on the street. And so when he said to Philip, 
What hinders me from being baptized? At least in part he was saying, are you sure I'm included? Can, will Jesus knock down all these barriers for me? And with joy, Philip could say, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. If you have trusted Jesus, you may. And I want to say that to you. If you have trusted Jesus, you may. Have you received Jesus? Have you been baptized? Well, I said just a couple of points. First one is, you must be saved before you're baptized. The second one is equally simple. When you are saved, you should be baptized. See, this man said, what prevents me from being baptized? And he then commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch, that's what we did today. And he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing and tr history tells us that he went down to Ethiopia, established a church, and became a missionary to his people. So, when you're saved, you should be baptized. Now, what does baptism means mean? It is symbolic. Baptism symbolizes death to your old life of sin and resurrection to new life in Christ. When you are laid back into the water, it is symbolic of what has already happened in you when you trusted Jesus. You died to your old life of sin. And when you come up out of the water, it's symbolic of your resurrection in Jesus Christ, that you have new life in Him. Uh, should we, is it okay to just be sprinkled? Or should you be immersed? The answer is, the word baptism means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. In, in uh, secular Greek, it was used to describe the sinking of a ship. And a ship doesn't sink by having water sprinkled on the deck, folks. Uh, the very word itself means to immerse. In fact, when our English, new, when the King James Version was, was first made back in 1611. The king, they, they brought the translation to the king and they had translated the words literally, immerse. And he said, oh, we can't do that. Our church, the Church of England doesn't immerse. You got to change that. So they just took the word, the Greek word, baptizo, and changed it to baptize. But it just means to immerse. So I believe the only scriptural way to be baptized is to be totally immersed. So if you come to us and say, I want to be a member of the church, we're going to ask you if you're saved. We're going to ask you if you've been baptized. And if you tell us you were christened as a baby, we're going to say, wonderful. Let's get baptized. And I know as you want to obey the Lord, You'll do that. Now, what's the significance? And with this, I'm done. What's the significance of baptism? First of all, it won't save you. The water of baptism will not wash away your sin. 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is our Savior. So why baptize? Well, it is an act of obedience. He told his disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We read that at the end of church every week. Now, if God had said, I want all believers to show their believers by wearing a feather in their hat. You know what I'd do? I'd have a uh, right down here, I'd have a cap with a feather in it. 
And when I went out the door, I'd put my cap with a feather in it on. Or if he said, I want all believers to carry a rock in your pocket, I'd have a rock in my pocket right now, wouldn't you? But that wasn't what he did, what he said. He said, believe and be baptized. And when I was 12 years old, I had trusted Christ as my Savior already a few years earlier. But I was baptized in the Wadley Baptist Church as a testimony of my faith in Jesus Christ. And you can too. Um, it is an act of obedience. Now, if a father said to his son, Son, I want you to pick up this boulder right here. We wouldn't blame the boy for not picking it up because he wouldn't have the power to do it. But if he said, Son, there's a stick by your foot. Would you pick that up? Pick it up. And the boy lets it lie because he doesn't want to. We would say, the first couldn't, but the one that could, he was told to do something easy that he could do. <laughs> and he didn't do it. So that shows his rebellious heart. You know what? Now that you know what the Lord commanded you to do, believe and be baptized. If you say, I don't think so, that shows your heart. The eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? I'll ask you, what's hindering you? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that because of Jesus, we can publicly declare our faith in you. And we do that because you have said to symbolize it with baptism. To symbolize death, burial, and resurrection. Yours and ours with you. And Lord, if there are some here who have never trusted you, I pray that right now they will turn to you in faith and say, Lord Jesus, I now trust you. Come into my heart. Thank you that my sin was laid on you. And now I right now transfer my trust to you. Take my sin away. Be the Lord of my life. Be my Savior. And Lord, when it's possible, I want to follow you in believer's baptism. I want to obey you. Lord Jesus, thank you for this simple story in Scripture that reminds us of the significance of baptism. And we give you praise and thanks, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. In your bulletin is a card. We're going to take the offering in just a moment. And if you uh, are interested in being baptized and would like to learn more,